Let's start this lesson by looking at what a function of two variables might look like if we graphed it. As you'll recall, this is what a function of two variables looks like. Here's an example. And what we've already seen in previous lessons is that we can plug x and y values into a function, do the PEMDAS, work out the math, and find the function value. But for graphing purposes, we could think of the function value as a third coordinate, sort of as a function coordinate, also sometimes known as a z coordinate. I could change this function to z equals if I wanted to. And now let's take a look at what this might mean to graph this point. If we were to graph all possible points in three-dimensional space, this function might have a surface that looks something like this. Now the colors in the grid lines aren't necessarily portions of the graph, they've just been added to help your brain see this object as a two-dimensional surface twisted into three-dimensional space. But to analyze more deeply what the point 4, negative 2, 52 would look like, we're going to look at our x, y, and z axis here and analyze these numbers. First of all, the point 4, negative 2 in the x, y plane would be right here. And just to orient you properly, because this computer program has kind of turned this graph around, here's where the traditional x and y axis would be, as you may be used to seeing it in other contexts. So we're kind of looking from far up in quadrant one back down at the graph here. And you can see here that that point in the xy plane actually is 4, negative 2. But what does the 52 mean? It means if we went straight up 52 spaces and found a point, that that would be on the surface of this graph with a z value or function value of 52. Let's take a look at one more arbitrary point. Let's plug in the point 3, 4, do the math, and we've got a function value of 33. So where is the point 3, 4, 33? Well, starting in the xy plane, here's the point 3, 4. Notice the way this program has drawn this picture. There's an x-coordinate of 3 and a y-coordinate of 4. And from that point, because the function value is 33, that means if we went 33 spaces up, we would arrive at a point whose z-coordinate is 33 and is also on that surface. And if we were to do this, not just for two points, but all infinitely many points in the xy plane, each one would lead to a z-value, and those collection of z-values would generate this two-dimensional twisted surface in three-dimensional space. That is the idea of graphing a function in two variables. Now we're going to take a look at how to find extrema and saddle points. Extrema just means maximum and minimum points of a two-dimensional surface in three-dimensional space. Here's the example used to illustrate this. When graphed using computer software, this, surf this surface looks like this. And one thing you may notice here is that there, and there appears to be a minimum point somewhere in this region. And there also appears to be what we call a saddle point here. Saddle point is a funny phrase, but it essentially means a point where the curve is flat, the surface is flat, but it's neither a minimum or a maximum. And you can see how this point would match that description. There don't appear to be any maximum points on this surface, but maybe there are somewhere else. We're not looking at the entire thing here. In order to find these things, we have to start by taking the partial derivatives with respect to x and y and setting them equal to zero and solving that system. Because it turns out anywhere that a function is flat, the derivative in the x direction and the derivative in the y direction are both going to be zero. So solving the system will find those points for us. So here's the original function. Here are the two partial derivatives. I recommend hitting pause just to verify. 
And now, if we set each one of those equal to zero, we will find our critical points. Here's the algebra that I used to solve this, this system of equations. Hit pause if you'd like to analyze that. And now that we've found the critical points, the next issue is to determine whether they're maximum, minimum, or saddle points. To do that, we need to get all the information about the second order partial derivatives. And we need to calculate something called the discriminant, or D. In order to calculate this, we first need the second order partial derivatives. Here they all are. Again, I recommend hitting pause just to verify the math. And now that we have the second order partial derivatives, we can take the formula for the discriminant, plug in all of our results, simplify, and now we have the discriminant function. And now we're ready to classify each one of our points. Let's start with the first point, 3, negative 5. Plugging in 3, negative 5 to D gives us this value. You'll notice there's no Y in the discriminant in this case, so there's no place to plug or no need to plug the negative 5. But what you'll notice here is we got a negative result for D. That means that we have a saddle point. And so we've classified the first of two critical points. Let's take the second critical point. Plug the point into D and notice we get a positive answer. If you looked at the left of your screen, you'll notice that a positive value of D could mean a minimum or a maximum. That would depend on whether or not the second partial derivative with respect to x is positive or negative. Taking the second partial derivative and plugging in the point in question leads us to a positive second partial derivative. And therefore, we can classify this point as a minimum. We're essentially done with this problem, and in most classes, mine included, you won't be required to produce any of these graphs. But even though we're done, it's nice to look back at the graph and see that what we found actually corresponds to something that we can see. For example, you'll notice here is the point I alluded to as a possible saddle point earlier, and this bottom point here in this portion of the graph is going to be a local minimum. But when you're asked to find and classify critical points, it's not enough to just say the x and y coordinates at which they occur. One also has to list the z coordinates so we know the physical location in space where they are. So what we'll do is we'll take the original function and we'll find the z coordinates. First, we'll plug in the minimum. I didn't show any, any arithmetic here, but when we plug in the xy value at the minimum, the z coordinate ends up being negative 89, work not shown, and that tells me where my minimum is in three-dimensional space. Likewise, for the saddle point, we could plug the x and y coordinate in. The result turns out to be 29, arithmetic not shown, and now we know the three-dimensional location of our saddle point as well.